actually planned before the Girl Meets World stuff came out. Um, and Michael, I think that sort of speaks to the legacy of the show. I mean, all of these people are here for you guys. Why do you think all these years later, I mean, it's been over, is it 20 years since the pilot kind of aired, 93? Why do you think it still has this legacy in television? Well, we never talked down to you. And I think you knew that right away. I think that what separated the boy from some of the other shows for this particular audience was that we operated thematically. We talked about the things that were going to happen next for you. And I think that you all appreciated that. I think that it was real. I think that we, we talked about friendship immediately and how important it is because to get through something alone was never quite as valuable as helping someone else through it as well. Um, then when episode four, I believe it was, Topanga entered the picture, and all of a sudden we had our triangle. So Ben becomes in the middle, and he's got two best friends. And what would the balance of those relationships be? And what I knew, what the network knew, was that that alone would keep you coming back because the three of those characters were so compelling and we spun out from there. And what we want to say, and, and, and I know this wasn't the question, but I want to say it right away, is we've had a very, very grateful and gratifying time recently because with the announcement of the new show, we were able to hear from you all over the internet in, in magazine articles about this show. And for people that do something and try and make a contribution to culture, to get the kind of response that you've given us lately, we applaud you and thank you very much for liking the show. Um, on that note, we actually have a little welcome video for you guys that we'd like to play before we do the rest of the panel. To this day, I think Ben and I, you know, if we were given a scene, it would be like, 
you know each other's acting, acting brains so well, and it's just so much fun. And kind of the same thing with um, Danielle coming to the cast and the Corey Topanga dynamic. So I've always planned when she was part of the show to have that young love story carry through the entire series, sort of be the, you know one of the two kind of back backbones of the show. Yeah, it was. There was never any question that there would be a love story in the show, but we thought that the the, the most interesting thing to do would be to start out understanding the boy. The pilot was about this confusion. The reason uh, Ryder's character, Sean, by the way, uh, Ryder's talking about insider stuff. Ryder was the first actor to show up in casting. Um, we, we, uh, um, um, there were, I don't know, 30, 40 guys on that day, and there were hundreds scheduled. And so the casting director uh, brought Ryder in, and I shook Ryder's hand, and he had done the Miserable. It wasn't, it was very young, so it wasn't a giant resume, but a very impressive one. And Ryder auditioned, and I turned to the casting director and said, okay, that's fine. And she said, what do you mean? I have 40 people out here, and we've got like hundreds. I said, no, that's fine, that's my guy. <laughs> and she said, well, shall I have everybody else go home? <laughs> and I said, no, have everybody else sit in that chair writer's talking about. <laughs> uh, but but uh, when, when we, we solidified um, the, the Corey's confusion in the pilot as to what life was, and then the fact that he had a best friend, the next natural step was to bring him to Panga. And it all clicked from there. And Ben, we saw Corey's sort of awkward years in navigating a romance as a I'm young boy. still having those awkward years. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I ever grew out of that awkward phase. Yeah, how much of that kind of translated to the screen? Because you guys were kind of the age that you were playing and young. Yeah. Is that weird? Was that weird? Um, to have your whole life uh, on camera from the time you're 13 years old? No, it's not weird at all. Um, I guess it was weird, but it was also just kind of the world I knew, and that's just the way I grew up. And, um, you know, it was a really fun, exciting experience, and I don't know, I think that uh, the writers and everyone did a really nice job of uh, not only, not avoiding it, but almost embracing kind of the awkward years of, you know, any teen. And I, again, I think that's what a lot of people um, can almost identify with, you know, when they watch the show. Like, oh, I went through that too, I went through that too, as opposed to characters that they couldn't really you know, relate to. So, it was nice, I guess. <laughs> uh, Betsy, you and, I mean, being a parent on the show nowadays, there really aren't parents like you were on the show. Did you know back then you were kind of part of a dying breed of responsible parent on a show? We miss people like you on series today. <laughs> So I think that what we did, what Rusty and I did, was what we would do with our own kids. And we treated each other with a great deal of respect. So um, it worked. I think it worked. And you guys tackled so many really serious issues on the show. Was that always really important to kind of ingrain in the series? Well, they sometimes wrote two two part episodes for me because I was good at crying or something. I don't know. <laughs> sort of big. Like when Topanga ran away, that was with Olivia Hussey, that was great. Um, yeah, there were some important things because that's what happens in life, you know, when you're growing up and marriages and all sorts of things. I think Michael really covered everything, I think, for seven years. I mean, that's a lot of years to cover all those issues because each age required a new element. Yeah, I think that one of the, the things that worked real well was that Beth and Rusty were really, really well respected as parents on the show. And the show that, that Beth is talking about, um, which is, we sort of fashioned uh, according to Angus, Rome and Juliet, and I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to actually get Juliet to be the conflict? Um, because Zeph Rowley's Romeo and Juliet, of course, started Olivia Hussey. And so Olivia Hussey played the Pang's hand. And what we thought was, if Betsy comes against this relationship, you know, if she was, if, if she was 
not like his mother, if she was uh, someone that wasn't as well respected and did such a great job, then it would have been tough to write that. But to have Betsy come against the relationship and to have then make this iconic monologue at his mother in defense of his love for Topanga and go against Betsy, that worked because you had somebody who was very respected as an authority figure and you had someone who was trying to find his way and the fact that he would defend Topanga to that authority figure worked so well for the audience. And I, I, came, I didn't cave in, I, I saw the light. That's what worked. You know, that was me. Sometimes parents can be wrong. <laughs> I believe. Um, Matthew and Mingling and Trini, you guys came in much later in the game, but for the audience at least, it, it seemed really seamless, all of your transitions on the show. I know you had kind of a funny story when we talked yesterday, but I mean, behind the scenes, was it as seamless? Was it easy kind of finding that chemistry with the cast back then? Well, um, for speaking for myself, uh, uh, the first week I was there, um, you know, I was to come uh, taping, you have a, a table read and then rehearse and you have a thing called a uh, run through. More of the writers and everybody that's involved, see how the progress is going. And, uh, and then after that run through, uh, you have notes where you're going to get notes and stuff on what you did. And I think out of the you know, uh, 100 notes for you, I got about 89 of them. <laughs> um, and uh, it, was, it was, I was, I felt, you know, like I was doing a really bad job. And uh, these guys all kind of rallied around me and, uh, and, and really just helped me elevate my game. And, uh, and Simulating into the cast, and it was just, it was just amazing how quickly it kind of happened. Literally, I think that third or fourth day just started starting out. So, great. Yeah. It's funny, I didn't audition for Woman's World, I auditioned for Sylvie Duck and Jack. So that's where I, I met Michael. Did you know that? So, when I came in, it's funny because for my audition, Mike gave me so many notes, and I was like, oh my god, he hates me. But then in the end, he's like, okay, I love you. <laughs> but um, I didn't get the part for Zoe, obviously. But Michael was so sweet. I mean, Adam said, we're going to add you to One Meets World. And I was like, oh my god, I want to be on One Meets World. But it was like the best day of my life. <laughs> so, um, but then when I came into the cast, I was really nervous because they were all an established cast. And everybody was like a family and everything. But they completely welcomed me with open arms because I was the, the last of these members to come in. So um, I really think it was special. It was really like a family show. Michael's like, Dad. <laughs> Zoe, Duncan, Jack, and Jane were in for about seven seconds. <laughs> Trina? Well, you know, my experience was really funny in auditioning because I auditioned five times before they finally said yes, and I would come into this, you know, producer's read, and it'd be me and five other girls. Okay, come back tomorrow. There's me and five other girls, new girls. And I just, I couldn't believe it when they actually cast me. I felt so blessed and I was so grateful. And I really enjoyed, I never felt, you know, you know, on the outside, I, you know, I felt more like, you know, this is an established family and it was my job to appreciate myself in, into their world, you know, Boy Meets World. And I, and I did the best I could. And I really liked the fact that there was, um, particularly in my storyline, there was always this, you know, colorless love between me and Sean, and I just thought it was so needed and important at the time. And um, yeah, I think it really did wonders for me as a person, and the feedback I get from audiences is just incredible. And, you know, and I hope it promotes more of that in the world, you know. But that's it, that's really amazing, you know. Now, Lily, you were on early in the series, and you just stole every scene you were in. The fans loved your little one-liners. Um, what was it like being the youngest of such a young cast and sort of coming in, saying a line, and leaving the scene? <laughs> um, it was an amazing experience. It really was. The cast, I mean, it was so much fun being on set with you guys. It was just a really joyous um, group, of, <clears throat> group of people, and it was such an honor to, to play with you guys. And um, I learned so much from being around you as an actor, looking up to you guys, and really learning from your your styles and your, your comedic deliveries. It was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. You were four. Yes, I was four. <laughs> Uh, since we just 
screened the finale, I feel I feel like it needs to be like mentioned. I was saying to writer yesterday that that was hardcore emotion from you in that final scene. Was that real? I mean, that's such a huge part of your guys' life. And saying goodbye to Mr. Feeney, that's tough. I don't tough. think you guys could hear us laughing in the back while that was happening because we, we snuck in to watch just the last moments there. And Michael is over my shoulder going, be a professional, don't grab your nose. And sure enough, on camera, I grabbed my nose because I was like snotting all over the place. We only did that, we only did that last scene in one take because we were all too just wrecked. It was our last, last scene, last in front of an audience. It was like, you know, seven years. It was kind of like high school, college, all rolled into one and saying goodbye to each other. And you had no idea what, what was, we were exactly in the position that our characters were in. I mean, to the extent that I was going to New York, like in my personal life, I was moving to New York to go to college. So it was like, I mean, it was so close to home that yeah, there's like no filter between Sean and Ryder at that point. It's just the same person freaking out. I even, I even kept the leather jacket and took it with me to New York. So. So, I know, I'm so pissed, like, and because, you know, I had, to, I had to give Disney a fake other leather jacket because they want to keep all that stuff, so sorry, Disney, I wow. <laughs> The leather jacket that's in your warehouse is all coming out today, guys. guys. All our Some hipster in Brooklyn stole it. <laughs> Anything else you want to admit, Ryder? <laughs> Any other stolen property you want to talk about? Ryder, you owe me 747 dollars yeah. About Danielle's oh. we, we were only going to do it one time. We, the writers and I, we stand off at a quad, what's called a quad split, which means we have four monitors, which are the four cameras. And I'm watching the scene, and I turn to one of the other writers that was Barry's after, who was on Sutherland somehow, and um, he says, What's on your neck? And I mean, there's tears coming out of my eyes because I'm watching each one of them. Ostensibly, my children go through this logic and going, we are actually only going to do this and in one scene. Fantastic. And Barry goes, I said, what's on her neck? And I go, uh, Chinese letters. And he goes, did you ever know they were there before? I said, hair has never given her pigtails before. And Barry said, why would they do that on a final scene of a seven-year run? I said, I don't know, but I can't fire them now, can I? Wait, um, did you guys watch that last scene? Because um, I was just going to pick up what Ryder was saying. Is that when we, were, when we were watching that scene, it really was like almost saying goodbye to our childhood. So when we were watching that episode, it's just, it, every time, I, I, it's hard for me to even watch that scene because it's really like, that was kind of the end of the end of our childhood. So it wasn't just the end of our show, but just for us personally, it just, it really meant a lot. And also, I was going through my closet the other day and I found these really nice black leather shoes. And I looked on the bottom and it said, Cory. And so, 13 years later, I still have that, those shoes. Sorry. <laughs> I'll pay you back. I would be doing a disservice to fans if we didn't talk about Mr. Feeney and the relationship between the core cast and him. And the final scene, it kind of sums it all up. It just, I don't know if when we all saw the pilot or early on in the series, we thought that would become such an integral part to the show, but did you always know that he was going to be this father, grandfather kind of figure to the kids? And why make that sort of the centerpiece of the finale? That was intended. That was how the show was actually sold. Um, it's a funny story, it's not a long one. Uh, I had just finished Dinosaurs, and, and uh, I was walking to my office at Disney, and there was a fellow who stopped me and said, come into my office, and he showed me a bunch of charts and graphs, and it was Procter & Gamble, how much money goes directly out of kids' pockets, how much money goes indirectly, which means allowance, um, and they, they make their father and mother buy and, and the fellow said, what can I show? And I said, I just finished this show. I, I'm, I'll go and I'll think about it. He said, you do a show for this demographic. You're writing well for this demographic. And what he made me think of was that all the shows that had been done were shows that family ties, um, uh, uh, growing pains. You take the oldest uh, brother or sister, 
you focus on them, you do the first day story. And I said, what if we took a middle child? What if the first day story was actually a betrayal because the brothers lived in the same room? So instead of going to the baseball game together, he took his first date, and the pilot was about the reaction of the younger brother to that. That was coming out of this man's office, and then I, I walked down to the president of Disney Television, and I said, I have something. And Boy Meets World was born right there. What's the conflict? Because we got poor relationships. Well, what if there's an implacable wall? What if there is a figure who is absolutely unable to be moved? Who would it be? In a child's world, if it's a workplace comedy, the workplace is school, the boss is the teacher. And what if the teacher lived next door? <laughs> and we had our show, because to give the authority figure proximity was everything. And the scenes at that little white fence with Bill and Ben, were to me, absolutely, a bill came to me one day, and, and this was about three episodes in, and he was getting tired already, because the kids were kids. <laughs> and, and Bill is an actor of a long red resume, and, and the kids did not respect that at all. And the kids thought he was from England, which we, <laughs> we used to talk about on the show. I don't know if it was Ben or, or Ryder. Well, you're British. You wouldn't understand this show. I'm not British. And, and that went on all the time. And, and, and Bill, Bill used to come to me and he would say, Michael, how long am I going to stand by this picket fence? And I said, why do you have to go back to England? And so that was when I joined the kids' army. And, I was happy to be all of our implacable um, Do you guys, I mean, just kind of going down the table or whatever order, do you have sort of a favorite moment for your character over all the seasons or a moment on the show? Anything? Whoever can jump in. I liked when I said, I'm the screamer up in here. <laughs> I love that, you know. That was my favorite moment, you know, aside many, many others. Actually, I got one more. I had, there was a scene where uh, we, there was a, it was a cheerleading episode, and I wasn't feeling so great that day, and Ryder whispers in my ear to say the line differently, real crazy, and stop kissing, right, before the take. And I did it, and it made everybody laugh, and I was like, what am I upset for? This is so silly, I'm on TV, you know? So I always remember that, because Ryder always was such a, such a champion for me, you know? <laughs> That uh, Scream episode that uh, we call it the Scream episode, it's like the Halloween, do you guys remember this one? It's, that was by far the most fun we've ever had, like probably in our lives. It was so, we, it was a disaster for Michael and everybody, you know, that actually had to get through that night. But for us, we were laughing so hard because it was the, one of the first episodes where we really went surreal, you know? Uh, Boy Meets World, like, by fourth or fifth season, we just started getting more and more meta referencing the fact that, like, you know, we replaced Lily with a different actress. It was like, what? And, like, we were making all these weird jokes, and, um, you know, so that episode really took it to the extreme. I, I watch it now, and I still don't know what's going on. It's like, um, but yeah, so it was a good reference all these horror films, but that was one of the best. We laughed so hard, but we couldn't get through a single take. One of the best nights. I concur. It was awesome. <laughs> I had one, um, but I can't remember it was a dream or what, but you were in jail, and I was Natasha, and Natasha and Bullwinkle. So I came in, I came in, you were in jail, and it was a dream. On the show, on the show. <laughs> now, Ryder was in jail. Okay, I'm sorry, but you, Go on. Corey, you were in jail, and I think it was a bad dream or something, but I was dressed up in, in 50s clothes, and I go in, and I go, do I have the papers? <laughs> Because I was Natasha. <laughs> Lily, do you have one together? Oh, yeah. yeah. My favorite was the war episode, and also the one after because we all got to work together. And um, it was kind of fun playing with Ryder that Ben had the best line of the whole episode. Yeah, we were going to 
You've never been to the beach with a wife before. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it as well as anybody. I was actually impressed that we got a pair. So you took a Um, that was real honey in that episode. <laughs> yes. You guys had to get a clean up. Yeah, there was a bear. There was a, there was a prank episode. There was a bear. And before the bear showed up on set, which was, it was a big bear, and they had like, you know, a chain around its neck, and they handed out flyers saying, okay, nobody have food anywhere near the bear, and don't move fast. Well, in the scene, we're covered in honey, and we run away from the bear. a girl meets world kind of question that I think all of you can kind of chime in on. Just why is now the right time for a show so similar to Boy Meets World to come back onto television? And why do you think the fan reaction has just been so immense? It's a different world than, than this cast met. And I think that... Um, <laughs> you were, were going to say something? No, no, please. please. No, please, go, go ahead. ahead. No, please. <laughs> Let's not fight in front of them. Just go. <laughs> okay. All right, tell me if you like this answer. Go. go. It's, it's a, a different different world than you met. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, I've watched television, and I love television, and I was a child of television, and, and we do what we love, and we've been very lucky. And I don't see anything on television r right now that is speaking to the audience that I have always spoken to and that I care very much about. The reason to do Girl Meets World now is because I think that television and this world, if we can do it and honor this show and make it unique because it's a different world, that's the reason to do it. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, Ben, I'm just gonna keep you from talking. <laughs> Okay. I had a favorite moment. Oh, yeah. yeah, of the whole series. And it's, oh, it's, and it's, and it's. I think this microphone isn't as good. I'm funnier in this microphone. <laughs> Camera one. Camera two. <laughs> okay, go on. Ready. Go. And, and my favorite moment had nothing to do with Ben. <laughs> what? It was, it had to do with my son, Daniel. Um, do you remember in, in the finale, I'm sure that it was part of the finale, the, the explanation of what Boy Meets World meant when the, the Joshua Matthews character was played by my son Daniel. Um, Daniel was also the little boy. All my kids got to be in the show. And, and, and um, Daniel was also the little boy with the shirt that came up to here in the hallway when he said, I saw dead people. And, and the writing staff said, you can't use Daniel again. And I said, all right, then I won't. I, I said, let's cast the role, we'll, we'll, we'll cast an actor. And we cast this actor who all he was supposed to do was stand next to Ben, be his new baby brother, and listen to him. This actor, Ben said, and the actor started tearing across the set, tearing across the set, hitting everybody. Wouldn't stop, started screaming, ow, wow. And, and, and one of the writers said, get Daniel. I called my wife, Patty, and I said, where are you? And she said, I'm at Gelson's, which was a grocery store in, in our town. And I said, are you with Danny? Yes. And, and bring him with what he's wearing. It doesn't matter what he's wearing. He needs to be on set now. And so Daniel shows up. And all I said to Daniel was, listen to Ben, watch him, don't say anything. And Ben said, Joshua, and Daniel goes, yeah. <laughs> and, and Ben is talking, and Daniel goes, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And, and Ben says, would you like to go over to the panga? And Daniel goes, to the panga. It was, it was one take, 
He was unbelievable, and on the back of his neck, he didn't have any tattoos at all.
we went to lunch together, we went to dinner together. Uh, I just, there, there is something so special about the bond we share. I always tell people this and it seems a little weird, but I keep thinking he does feel like my husband. Like he will, he will always be my first husband. <laughs> Yeah, I think Danielle said it perfectly, actually. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I think we were both a little apprehensive and nervous about it, but it really was, it was just, I mean, I think these characters were written so well, and they were written so perfectly to match our personalities, that it was, I mean, when you're watching the show, Boy Meets World, I mean, that's us. I mean, for the most part, that really is how we are. And uh, so, it's, it, you know, was it hard being Corey again for this, for the new show? I mean, was, I was a little scared, but you know what? It was, it was actually pretty smooth. It was a pretty smooth transition. Was Will really like Eric? <laughs> you made me go right there. <laughs> Will, Will was not like Eric in the beginning. Be because he had, a, he had a fine mind, and, and he spoke in complete sentences. But when I asked him not to, his facility for being less than human was astounding. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to answer it. I turn it over to you guys. Ryder, Ryder. <laughs> no. There's no way. No. I mean, but that's the thing about Eric as a character is that he was sort of a different character every line, every scene. And, and Will, I mean, I think we all realize, I'm sure, I mean, Will became a genius comedic actor before our eyes. Like, in the original uh, couple, the first season, really, I mean, Will will say this, too. He's like, I learned how to act. Because he's like, I didn't know how to act that whole first year. But I also think it was because he didn't really have much of a character. Sort of like, he was the older brother, and, you know, he was like, at first, he was kind of a good-looking guy who could always get dates. And then, like, that didn't really work, and he was kind of too funny. And anyway, by the time, you know, he was doing plays with squirrels, it was like... <laughs> This is Will's wheelhouse. Like, just give him some weird makeup, put him in a couch, anything, and he'll run with it. And I mean, it was insane. I think mean, working with Will was probably, I mean, for me, one of my favorite experiences of the show. And, and he would get a scene, you know, we all, all of us would get a scene and we'd read it aloud. And kind of like after seven years, you know each other so well. It's like, I, could do, I know how Ben's going to say this line. He knows how I'm going to say this line. No one knew how Will was going to do anything. I mean, he would just show up and it would be like, who are you? Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a genius. I think his parents to Will, we would just go, really? <laughs> we just kind of shook our heads. He was always a surprise. It was a little bit, a little Michael J. Fox. A little bit. Um, we have question time. You guys have questions? I don't know if microphones are going around, so I'll start in the front. I think in the beginning, um, you have to please the studio, you have to please the network, you have, you, you have your corporate masters. When they realize oh, we have a hit on our hands, they start trusting the people who gave them the hit. With that trust, we were able to be who we really were. And what we did was hit the accelerator. Um, the, the, the promise of it was at the beginning. The fulfillment of it hit, as you say, in the middle, and went on through the end. Uh, but let, let Ben answer that, and the, and the rest is what their experience was. Me. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I thought that was a good answer. I think that's good. That was really entertaining, writer. <laughs> oh, you know, the only thing I would add is that we were, Boy Meets World was in this weird position. We were a hit show, I mean, that we were on the air, we were getting good ratings, 
but we weren't as big as a lot of the other shows around us on TGIF, like Sabrina the Teenage Witch that was getting much higher ratings than us, and they even, ABC even pushed us to a 9.30 time slot for uh, half a season. So we were in this weird position where we felt like we had an audience somewhere, but we, we weren't in communication, this is pre-internet, so we, didn't, we, we started, I think, pushing the envelope a little bit more because we felt like we can't lose, you know? We, we can only take more chances and, and do what we really want to do, and I think it paid off. I think that those later seasons got better and better and took more and more chances because in a way, we sort of felt like, you know, no one's writing articles about that few cra crazy new show, Boy Meets World. We were just kind of this safe Friday night, you know, and it was like we, we had our own playground, you know? No one was paying attention to us. That's how I felt. You know, it's, it's funny because Maitland did something a moment that you're looking for is shows are music. I mean, to me, and to, to, to every, it's no coincidence that, that real good comedians also play an instrument. Uh, Steve Martin, banjo, Dr. Marshall. I play the piano. piano. <laughs> and there's an exception to every rule. <laughs> but, 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 but Maitland hit when Ben's music changed. We were doing 2-4, because, because that's, that's what, what you recognize. You, you recognize 2-4 time. It's predictable, you get what's going to happen. All of a sudden, um, Ben would do things. It, it wasn't scripted. When, when, when Maitland said that line, and, and Ben, I, I can't remember what exactly was exactly, and I looked at the quad and went, what did he do? And all of the writers are laughing, and I start laughing, and we, we do a second take of it. And all of a sudden, Ben started hitting half notes. And he paced up, and he took the character, and he decided who Corey Matthews was. And that's a proud moment. For, for any father, when your child decides, I now can ride this bike without you, fantastic. And that was the difference, you noticed. Question? Um, in the back there? Yeah, Michael, uh, Danielle, uh, uh, called you perfectionist, and uh, and one thing that you just shared with us was that uh, you know when her tattoo was showing, you were like, oh, let it fly because you enjoyed the scene. How do you find uh, a balance between being a perfectionist and knowing, oh, let's just let it fly and see what happens? I don't. <laughs> I, I I apologize to you. I did not mean to. Intimate that I was fine with the tattoo. I'm still talking about the tattoo. We only have 60 minutes here with you, and I'm talking about the tattoo for an awful long time. That tattoo, I would take a knife. That tattoo ain't gonna be on Gormy's world. I, I, don't, I don't know. There's perfectionist is some, something that, that I, I don't think it's right to try to be perfectionist because you can never achieve it. I do know that if you trust and honor the audience and there's a moment that you're watching in front of you and you believe it can play better, you have to at least make a suggestion to your cast who you trust and see what they next do with it. We always got better. Always got better. Frankly, the show never had to be canceled. Uh, I think TGIF came off the air. I remember the fellow's name was Stu Bloomberg called and said, um, that's it. We're, we're gonna move on from TGIF. You did a remarkable job, and all of the shows came down. The 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 thing is, is is that um, Boy Meets World, at the end of its seventh year, could have gone to an eighth year, a ninth year, a tenth year. Watching them grow was your fascination and my fascination, and they had begun to do it themselves. The show could have easily stayed alive. And in those responses I'm talking about before that you've had, you're proving that and we appreciate it.
and, and let them help you pull you into the moment. And another trick, I like to think of, uh, I, I like to think of something like if I have to be happy, I think of a happy moment. I'm pretty basic about it. You know, sometimes I think in acting people think too much. You know, and um, I think with all of us, we just really supported each other. We kept it real natural, and, and we had fun. I mean, the behind the scenes fun really kept it like, all right, we can do this. You know. We also kept a lot of sugar on set <laughs> and a lot of candy, which I always found very helpful. And, and we worked with Will, so we were always in the moment. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. I'm just going to add to that a little bit. This is the grown up. <laughs> sort of a grown-up, but as the parent or whatever, but one of the things that I believe is, as an actor, is that it's about relationship, and we had such great relationships. Rusty and I just adored each other, we just, and I adored the kids, and, and they, and we had this love thing going, so it wasn't hard when you went to that as an actor, to, to, Get into it, you know, even if you don't feel good that day or you don't feel like it or whatever. And once you hook into the relationship, then, then it's there. I, I think also, too, every actor uh, feels that way. And I think you still, you know, every actor will always feel that way. Um, you're always going to have off days, right, no matter what. So don't get, you know, discouraged uh, by that. In fact, that's kind of a driving force for how you get better. So it's normal. <laughs> You're, You're okay. okay. <laughs> You're okay. It's really cool for us to get to see guys get together, but showing them a long time ago and you were part of each other's lives for so long. What have your relationships like with each other been over the years? Do you get together? Have you ever seen William Daniel? What has how has it been in the last thirteen years showing? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, we're acting now. <laughs> we have stayed together. We are a family. Uh, uh, like most families, not every day. Uh, but certainly, too much time never goes by without us seeing each other. I, I, we all keep in contact with Bill. I spoke to Bill uh, uh, about three days ago, uh, and uh, he's doing great. Uh, he just did an art on Grey's Anatomy. I don't know if you guys got to see that. He said, Michael didn't even die. Who is that? Who? Did you spend half a spell with Bill Long? Can I talk about one of the last ones? Yeah, yeah why not? No, I can't. I can't. I can't. Uh, no, nope, we've given it away. <laughs> I saw Bill recently. <laughs> and he was great. He gave Will, he gave Will and I a big, big hug, and you know, he's 85 years old, and um, <laughs> I, 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 did, didn't he start acting when he was five? I mean, he's like, he's been doing years. this for 80 years. And, you know, yeah, he had an accident. <laughs> <laughs> you know Bill Daniels, you know, I, I had no idea who Bill Daniels was. And I don't think any of us did when we first started. He was a British guy. Yeah, he was a British guy. <laughs> but I, I got all excited when during notes, my, Michael give, was giving notes, and, and Bill Daniels goes, now, Michael, and I go, no, you And he's like, <laughs> Two Emmys, nothing. All I care is you were the coolest car in the world. And the red hat? Uh, so, Roger, you just, a couple questions ago, you said, you mentioned how you guys were sort of in the same spot on Fridays at 9 30, sort of the same show, but you guys did do the one episode about underage drinking, which caused a little bit of controversy. And, Michael, you talked before about how we're in a different world now. Do you see more of a place for those sort of uh, I do, but I'm going to have to be very clever on how I put them through to you, aren't I? The, 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 the thing, the episode you talk about, there are episodes, for example, uh, Boy had a long run on, on Disney Channel, uh, ABC Channel, but, but uh, it was Disney Channel would not run the prom episode. Uh, and I think the episode you're talking about, I don't think it would run on Disney Channel. Right. Uh, but that, that run was years ago. The question of would they run it now is an interesting question. I think that when s the way something is couched, it's how you tell a joke. You know? Someone can start telling you a joke and you go, we've heard this before. You, 
you know, and, and, and I have to spend the next minute and a half listening to this joke and I've heard it before in a punchline. And then someone can tell you the same joke and dance all around it. And so the thing to do is really to build a fence around this is a very special episode. Boy was successful at it, and I hope Earl will be successful at it too. And then Mary back. Um, well, first I want to say, I think that y'all had uh, Ben and Ryder have virtual romance on TV. I appreciate that. Y'all did a great job of that. And it was really cool as a young person to feel like I can really, really, really love my friends, and that's a celebrated thing. So that was really cool. But, Michael, I had a question for you. Um, I feel like the spiritual aspect of the show is kind of overt. And you know, y'all have referenced prayer and God. And, when Ben or Corey kissed the ski lodge girl, Ryder said, read the Bible. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious, like, if that was really intentional on your part. I feel like that's what made a lot of this really, you know, kind of resonate with the show more. So can you speak to that aspect of it? Yeah, thanks for, I don't want to monopolize this, but thanks for asking that particular question. I'm a deep believer, and anything that I write is, is going to uh, at least try to espouse that, that uh, I would never specifically uh, espouse uh, uh, a personal belief, but my belief in God and my belief in that the universe is a well-run place and we should be uh, uh, treating each other a particular way will be part of any project I ever do. Um, it, was, it was a, a vast part of, of Boy Meets World uh, and would be part of any project. I think it's important. That's, that, that, that's correct. 
And so, and so it's just interesting the way things work out, but they never were reticent about any idea the writing staff had for them. Um, and I'm telling you, it was Danielle who gave us the idea, and they said, what should we, the director said, what should we say? Give her the scissor, and she cut. And, and that's fascinating for me.